Scottish Highlands, Dr. Archie Tom believes he has proof that standing stones mark full-scale observatories used by prehistoric astronomers. His theory, first suggested by his father, an Oxford professor, is that the stones were aligned with distinctive features on the horizon. In this case, a cleft in the hills, the Paps of Jura, 26 miles away. The Tom's surveys suggested that the astronomers stood on this platform known to be man-made. In an age when Scotland enjoyed fine weather, they could fix the date of the winter solstice by standing in line with the stone and watching the sun set precisely in the cleft of the hills of Jura. The Toms believe ancient astronomers used observatories like this to fix their calendars for the business and ceremonial of their year. A computer has already established what seem to be dozens of astronomical alignments at Stonehenge. But strange pits on the top of the Stonehenge lintels have inspired this American schoolmaster, Richard Brinkerhoff, to suggest an even more exotic astronomical theory. He believes the ancient astronomers used the top of Stonehenge as a catwalk. From there, with the help of sighting poles stuck into the pits, they could observe important developments in the cycles of the moon. There are 11 pits altogether, probably. Perhaps more obscured by later erosion. These two particular holes, like all the others, were probably used as sites by people on top of the lintels yonder, looking past them at moonrise on the distant horizon. The northernmost point that the moon ever rises on the horizon, as seen from across the circle, is identified precisely by the farthest of these pits behind me, above which the moon rises once every 57 years. The northernmost point that the sun rises is identified, by, seen by a man across the circle, is identified by the pit right there in front of me. All of the pits between these two identify intermediate stages in the moon's motion northward along the horizon in those regions where the sunrise never occurs. There's no doubt that some of these stone circles do have astronomical alignments, but this doesn't mean that their builders were skilled astronomers. As for the other circles, the majority, well, perhaps they were no more than meeting places, the equivalent of the village hall, if you like. We can't prove this because all the structures disappeared except for the basic stones. Look at this forest of columns around me. No one would ever have guessed what this was. In fact, these pillars were the foundations of a very tall building, many stories high, built about 2,000 years ago. But all the wood has vanished. So today, it's impossible to guess what the original structure was like. And that may be the case with the still unexplained stone circles. But the incredible scale of this circle at Avebury in Wiltshire almost defies modern explanation. It covers 28 and a half acres and encompasses a whole village. In the ancient world, some experts believe, it must have been such a showpiece that Stonehenge, with its weird arches, was built later as a rival attraction. Avebury must have been a massive undertaking. Its construction leaves archaeologists awestruck. Dr. Aubrey Burr. The amazing thing is that places like Avebury and Stonehenge were built with tools as simple as this antler pick, which I've just driven into the ground with a lump of stone. And the people who built these places 
would use tools like this to break up the chalk which lies underneath all this grass and earth, lever it out into huge blocks, and then, having done that, they'd take another very, very simple bit of equipment they had, the shoulder blade of an ox, they'd use this to shovel up the chalk into wickerwork baskets, chalk which of course was as hard as rock, it's not as soft as the sort of stuff we use in, in classrooms, it really is very, very hard. They'd get it into a basket like this and then hefting it up onto their shoulder, they'd carry this up the sides of the ditch to the bank where they'd dump load after load after load of it until the bank was 30 or 40 feet above them. Now, the amazing thing is that this ditch where I'm standing is only the top because when it was excavated just before the First World War, it was discovered that it's at least 18 to 20 feet deeper than this. All this is just material that has fallen in over the last 4,000 years. And when the ditch was first dug, it would have been sheer-sided. It was so steep, in fact, that the workers had to leave little steps in the chalk so they could lift the chalk up and out, up to the ditch. And it would have been so deep that had someone had a telegraph pole at the bottom rising up here the top would not have shown above the sides of the ditch it's an incredible undertaking and it must have taken 50 60 generations of people people who would be born in the middle of the work would work all their lives at it and yet would never see it finished and then inside the ditch were the great circles of stone we know they were dragged several miles from the Marlborough Downs to Avebury. The stones were carefully selected for size and shape. When we look at a huge thing like this, it wasn't moved very easily, but what isn't obvious is the work that went on before they moved the stone, because they couldn't just get hold.